What makes you hopeful about tomorrow? Robots. <laughs> <laughs> what makes me hopeful is the ability for robots to take over jobs that are dull, dirty, and dangerous, hmm. and free us up to be putting our efforts towards、uh, making things better for one another. So my name is Carla Diana. And I am a product designer who is focused on physical things that have、uh, digital interaction to them. And in specific, I work on the design of robots.、Um, and I work as head of design for a company called Diligent Robotics that is making a robot for the hospital setting. And in addition to that, my big Passion project is launching, creating, and leading the 4D design program at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. For for those who don't know,、uh, Cranbrook has a lot of history and sort of craft and、um, individual study. I'm sure you can add more to that. But what is what was the purpose, or what is the purpose of and the mission of the 4D program at Cranbrook? So yeah, I mean, to just to give a little bit. More background. Cranbrook is a very small, graduate-only, two-year Master of Fine Arts、um, school, and there are all, there's only it's only graduate school, and it's only art design and architecture, and it has this very rich history with、uh, very famed artists such as Harry Bertoia and Carl Millis and、uh, lots of folks in the Fine arts area, but in the specifically in the design arena,、um, Ilya Saarinen was the first leader here and set up、um, the entire school really with our founder. And、um, Charles Eames was the first、um, person in the position that I am in, basically, who is a we call ourselves designers. We're a designer in residence and. The、um, program is largely focused around more like coaching students who are、um, advanced and in doing individual programs, individual projects, self-directed learning. So it's big shoes to fill and an exciting place. And、um, two years ago, I was asked to create the 4D design program and brought to it、um, a vision and a mission around interaction design that specifically. Focused on the physical world, so we are looking at every project holistically. Whereas a lot of interaction design programs might be focused on software and screens, because that's where a lot of business is focused. We are bringing、uh, Cranbrook's whole legacy of understanding the nuances of the physical object and craft, and、um, bringing that to interaction design, so that we are thinking not just about a screen, but we're thinking. About light and sound and motion, and I say that our craft, so to speak, is composed of three things, which would be code. There's a craft to coding, form, so understanding the physical object, what is manifesting, how is it expressing itself, and electronics. So all of our students know how to solder. They know how to work with、um, prototyping solutions like Arduino and Raspberry Pi. They understand, you know, basic electronics and circuitry. And I know one of the areas where we kind of connect on is is a, a, a passion for different modes of transportation, and、um, you know how how you can bring design to that. So,、um, what's and I, I also know that there's some new stuff starting in Detroit right now.、Um, what's happening there? What I've been excited about in my return. So what we didn't mention is I'm also a Cranbrook、hmm. alum. So I did live here before. So I knew what I was coming、right. into. And one of the bigger ideas that I've had in coming back. To the Greater Detroit area has been、um, to explore ways that autonomous autonomous vehicles. Since so much of my work and my colleagues and folks like you work in in the you know automated vehicle realm in some way, how the combination of autonomous vehicles and the sharing economy can、um, ideally bring back. Public transportation to places where it seems like you could never have them at all, 
and mm -hmm. that you know that public transportation <clears throat> being shared autonomous vehicles that can you know there are there are certainly visions i had at one point done a vision for the guardian that was a series of illustrations around how cars could come together and form trains and then break off to go the last mile to people's homes and maybe park themselves on rooftops or um you know leaving space open in streets for more you know community focused activities and mm. so i've been in the midst of trying to encourage that dialogue a, a year ago i put together a panel discussion with um some folks working locally here um and i um have connections with a former Cranbrook alum, um, Jeff Sturges, who is leading a prototyping effort at an innovation lab at Ford. And, um, uh, you know, I, I've been connecting with a lot of the, there's just a ton of robotics here in Detroit, mm -hmm. largely mm -hmm. around manufacturing, but all of that brain power around just robotics in general, I think is able to be now merged with the automotive industry to to make this a real hot spot for um, robotic vehicles, essentially. Hmm. And are you working on any any car designs, or have you have you thought about porting any of your robotic design knowledge to cars or or autonomous vehicles? Yeah, I have. I haven't been working directly on anything like that, but I've had a long-standing um, professional. Uh, collaboration with a woman named Dr. Wendy Ju, who is at Cornell Tech, and she and I, for a, for a long while, we were co-authoring the book that I mentioned together, and then we um, got to a point where we decided that it was better for me to take over as the main author, but she contributed tremendously to that, and a lot of the um, principles and ideas in that book are um, influenced by a lot of the work that she does in her lab at Cornell Tech that is hmm. all around thinking about the social interactions between people and vehicles. Like even something as simple as the um, interaction that takes place between a pedestrian and a car at an intersection uh, mm -hmm. depends largely on two, two people making eye contact or you know perhaps small gestures like I've just moved my car up a couple of inches it means that I think that you're staying at the intersection or you know or the pedestrian making a move like mm -hmm. so I think there is a lot of um, interesting <clears throat> interactions to be explored between people and the robots um that that are in, that come into play in autonomous vehicles as well as everything that takes place inside the car so i did write a piece for popular science it's called don't blame the robots blame us and by blame us what i really mean is designers and i mm -hmm. what i'm looking mm -hmm. at there is um i mean there are certainly there's certainly the impact of how the autopilot at that particular time was marketed, um, even just calling it autopilot and talking about all the things that it can do autonomously. We, I think, are steeped in this um, uh, science fiction idea of the car just taking over and we think, oh, well, there, it's this robotic car. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's only um, one, uh, among the first stages of autonomy. Um, but in that piece, what I uh, wrote about was how we as designers have to understand the mental model of the person in the car and that they are imagining a robot brain as understanding certain things and um, it's important that the person have a, a sense of what that robot brain is and um, know when mm -hmm. one of the most critical moments is the handoff moment. So when the vehicle recognizes that like, this is a situation that I'm not familiar with, I need a, a human to take over. All you know that has to happen in a fraction of a second, ha sometimes. So how how does right. the car let people know? And it's all around you know haptics and again expression. It's all coming back to how does the physical object 
that is digital as well express itself? Like, does the handlebar vibrate? Are there lights hmm. on the dashboard? Is there, you know, something call the call to attention to a screen that that says like, hey, I don't recognize this object in front of me. We're going to have a collision, you know, and vice versa. How does the person then say, oh, hey, I'd like the vehicle to know? take back over so you know there's been a lot of study around situation awareness and I did some interviews for that piece hmm. etc so that you know that's where my um, experience about robotics intersects with uh, what's going on with vehicles right now hmm. uh, like how, how do you prototype that or how do you what what is the, what's like a summary of your process for that yeah I think that's where prototyping um, is really key. I think that's where drawing a picture of a design doesn't doesn't nearly capture anything. Um, mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot that happens through scenarios and with my clients and with like all the work at Diligent. I work a lot around um, scenarios and um, body storming uh, mm -hmm. workshops. Um, you know, that's more like that robot is not a vehicle, but but it's essentially a vehicle. I mean, so it's kind of like a vehicle that's in the hallways of a hospital, so to speak. <laughs> You know, people don't ride in it, stuff rides in it, but um, it is navigating the space autonomously. So we do, a, we would do a lot of what I would call body storming exercises where one person actually pretends to be the robot and then we kind of replicate, you know, what some of the environments are in the hospital, um, you know, around prototyping some of the vehicle stuff. Um, Wendy's lab's done some, and she used to be at uh, Stanford as well. Um, you know, I've, I've been, following and will do some um, some of those methods. I mean, I also use video prototyping quite a bit with my clients, um, as well as an Arduino where uh, I will replicate what the key moments of expression and interaction are between. So we're not, you're not trying to use an Arduino to replicate, like I worked on one project that was around the water purification and needing to know when the purification was done, needing to know when the thing needs to be charged, all these kind of like simple, somewhat simple things, but you need them to happen in an intuitive way and they happen through light and sound and, and, and not, you know, like a big screen thing, like everything's charged. Um, so those kind of things I would prototype, I, I will prototype in my studio with an Arduino and, and you know, really kind of love that kind of work. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think you have to be really clever about, about the, the body storming and, and um, replicating the experience, the core aspects of the experience without trying to engineer the whole thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. They're sort of like key, key pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get to the book. So the book is called My Robot Gets Me. What could readers expect? What readers can expect is to have a book that um, extrapolates on a framework that helps you think about how to design smart objects. And the reason that we need a framework is because there is so much involved, right? You, I mean, you guys know this at Tomorrow Lab, all the projects that you work on, there is, um, you know, you're thinking about industrial design, for sure, engineering. You're thinking about um, you're thinking about all of those those dynamic properties that I talk about, light and sound mm -hmm. and movement. You're thinking about software and software hardware integration. You're thinking about how um, you know its connectivity, um, etc. So um, this book it's uh, it's not engineering focused at all. It's purely design focused. It is really about um, insisting on having the social interaction between people and their objects be the core nugget of all design activity. So, um, and it's uh, for people who are steeped mm -hmm. in this field, um, they may uh, recognize a lot of the methods, but then I feel like it would be a helpful tool to bring to all of the other folks in the organization because, you know, there is so much involved that you really need mm -hmm. everyone from the CEO to the head of engineering to the head of marketing, everybody has to be kind of on the same page. But I think it's a great book to share with organizations. And the framework starts out with this nugget that is around um, what I call presence. 
So okay. the physical manifestation of the object, traditional industrial design, let's say a Ford instance of mapping and that kind of stuff. And then we add on to that expression. So expression again is the light sound and movement. And then um, onto expression, we start to talk about interaction. So once you bring sensing into it, you have the object talking to a person, but then you can also have the person talking back to the object. And I say talking in quotes, it may be a gesture, it may be a touch, it may be as simple as a button, but it's interaction. So then there, that's a two-way street conversation. Um, and then beyond that, we think about context. So where is the object? When is the object expressing itself? What is the state of mind of the person using the object? Um, beyond context, we have ecosystems. So oh. how are objects communicating with one another and you know what are families of products in this realm and that's the that's really the framework and then and then it culminates in talking about intelligence and how ai machine learning and, and um neural networks are, are being utilized to help um products be social I'm familiar with Asimov's three laws of, of ro oh, robots, yeah. which uh -huh. feels like, I mean, it, it's, it's decades old. Um, basically the, uh, a robot shall not injure humans. It will uh -huh. obey humans and it must protect humans, yeah. which sort of like, I think I'm, I'm not steeped in this as much as you are, but it feels like those are the only existing rules for how to design good robots. Um, do you feel like your, your your presence, expression, interaction, context, ecosystem, intelligence builds on top of that, or it sort of sits adjacent to these like fundamental laws? Oh, I think it definitely sits adjacent to that. I mean, I know that those Asimov laws are often quoted in the um, in the context of, of robotics and robot design, um, and they're great. I mean, look, I grew up on Asimov, but they're they don't get into the nuances of ethics that are currently need to be explored. So there are, you know, several um, uh, organizations now or, or groups there, you know, I know my, I, I also, I host a podcast it's called the Robo Psych Podcast. I forgot to mention in my intro. Um, and uh, I co-host with a fellow named Dr. Tom Goriello, who is a PhD psychologist and he sits on a committee for ethics that I think is put together by IEEE, the um, electrical engineering organization. Um, and they're, you know, like take something as simple as the um, robot must also pr always protect the humans. Well, then you bring into um, uh, the, the question, um, uh, there is something that's called the trolley problem that's talked about in ethics circles a lot. And mm -hmm. what that is, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are already familiar with it, but you know, if, if there are, um, if someone's driving, if a robot is driving the trolley and they could hit, uh, they're about to hit a child um, on one, the path that they're on. And if a switch is switched on, then everyone in the trolley will die. What is the right thing to do, right? And, and you know, and then there are like a thousand permutations of that ethical question, right? I mean, we are talking about life and death, particularly when we're talking about autonomous vehicles. Um, but you know, so much of robotics. I mean, we won't even get into the, all of the you know military applications and um, all of the ethics involved there. And it's it's very dense and it's very complex. And and it's you know, it's one of the things that I'm. Um, hoping and looking forward to I have one student in particular who who specifically wants to focus on issues of ethics during his time here in the Cranbrook um, mm. in the 4D design program so I think that there's uh, a lot of work to be done in that area. What do you think will be fundamentally different about uh, your sector in five years and you get to define because I know you wear many hats so you get to define what your sector is. I think that what will be fundamentally different is that as opposed to being geek stuff, it will be everyday stuff, which again, I think during the pandemic, we're seeing glimpses of that where, um, you know, if you mentioned video chatting nine months ago to most mm -hmm. people, they would say, yeah, I don't, I don't what? 
And now, you know, there's everyone is video chatting. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, three-year-olds, everyone. My five-year-old knows how to mute the microphone on Zoom by himself, you know, like, wow. and, and the kids have to do that. Like the, yeah. the, the teachers are teaching them. Wow. So, wow. you know, we can extrapolate that to robotics to, you know, I think, yeah, a lot of the autonomous devices. Hmm. Carla, thanks again for this. Good. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I, I love the idea of the Tomorrow Talks. I've been loving teardowns. I, I think, you know, you guys bringing your passion into content that you can, that is shareable. I think a lot mm -hmm. of design tends to be kind of like under wraps. And I think having shareable content is really fabulous. So thanks for making thanks. part of it.